collect for the epiphany or the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. O God, who by the leading of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son to the Gentiles of the East, mercifully grant that we know, who know thee now by faith after this life have the fruition <coughs> in the he new heavens and new earth through the same Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, we're on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we're on January 1, New Year's Day. O oh God, <coughs> whom neither time nor space can limit, hold or bind, look down from heaven, thy dwelling place, with love for humankind. Something that Boltman would have mocked. Something we're finding John A.Q. Robinson has got problems with. But we'll see what John's up to. He's a bishop of Willich. I don't know. I don't know if he died. It's a 20th century. Published his Honest to God, which is a goofy name, in 1863, outlining his fears and insecurities, uh, lack of catechetical work, very poor theologically. This here, Studies in Theology, uh, was a set of lectures, 288 pages, given at Chicago Theological Seminary or University, Chicago Theological Seminary, in 1894, that might have turned into McCormick, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a divinity faculty at University of Chicago, at least it was in the past, liberal Baptists. Old money um, that established it. Preface the, the lectures which compose these volumes were delivered in April 1895 to the Chicago Theological Seminary and are published at the request of the faculty of that institution. They do not amount to a system of theology, but the writer believes they are consistent with each other and would find their place in the system. They were printed as they were delivered with one exception, the ninth lecture, which excited considerable discussion in the circles to which it was first addressed, has been rewritten. Not with the view of retracting or qualifying anything, but in order as far as possible to obviate misconception and secure a readier acceptance of what the writer thinks true ideas on the authority of scripture. <clears throat> the notes have been added partly to justify the statements made in the lectures as to the opinions of various theologians and schools, partly to acknowledge the writer's obligations to others. I'm not sure what that means. Ch chapter 1, the idea of theology. 2, the witness of Jesus to himself in a 20-page lecture. 3, the apostolic doctrine of Christ for man and sin the work of Christ in relation to sin, the New Testament doctrine of the atonement. That's a casualty of the modern period. Six, the work of Christ in relation to sin, the inadequate doctrines of the atonement. Seven, Christ in his exaltation. Eight, church in the kingdom. Nine, Holy Scripture. Ten, eschatology, I guess. Oh, it was the ninth one, Holy Scripture. Uh-oh. <laughs> lively discussion. Lecture on the idea of theology. A treatise on systematic theology usually begins with the definition. The analysis and defense of which may show that all, all that the theologian has to teach us. For the purpose which I have in view, it is not necessary that I should aim here at excessive precision, but it is necessary to indicate what I conceive the subject to be, what can be made of it and what a fair treatment of it requires. If this lecture seems too abstract or indefinite, I can only hope that this appearance will be removed when we come to consider the various topics. And I think I'm going to try to check into Danny on the Atonement. I've got them over there on the shelf. 
one of the one of the classics. We or he's got one of the justification too. That's memory search. Maybe that's the one I got. But the doctrine of God and the very nature of the case is related to everything that enters into our knowledge. Thank you. There's a reform view. All our world depends upon him. And hence it follows that a systematic presentation of the doctrine of God involves a general view of the world through God. It must contain the ideas and principles, including the sciences, not as independent fields of inquiry, but as theological inquiries, which enable us to look at our life and our world as a whole and to take them into our religion instead of leaving them outside. What, however, we have specially to deal with is not theology, but Christian theology, that knowledge of God which belongs to us as Christians and which is traced back to Christ. We know that Christ claimed to possess a unique and perfect knowledge of God and to impart that knowledge to his disciples. If we're really Christians, we must be sharers in it. We must know God. And our task when we theologize is to define our knowledge, to put in scientific and systematic form, and to show at least an outline, that general view of the world which it involves. The Christian religion, it has been said truly enough, is not a revealed metaphysic. Still less is it a revealed natural science. We disagree there. Nevertheless, the Christian mind, which would understand the truth which it possesses, which would not keep its religious convictions in one compartment of the intelligence and all its other operations and others, must not be afraid of as much metaphysics as is implied in the general view of the subject. I put this in the foreground because by far the most influential most interesting and in some ways most inspiring of modern theologians virtually makes the denial of it a great principle of his theology. I refer to the late Professor Ritchell. Religion according to Ritchell is one thing. Metaphysic is another. We disagree with Ritchell there. Theology has only to do with religion of metaphysics, it must be carefully kept clear. Ritual's wrong. This is pure papal dogma coming out of Germany again. The Christian knowledge of God is not scientific. That needs a lot of work. It is not a natural theology derived from reason. It has not even a relation to such a natural theology. It depends simply and solely on the revelation made of God in Christ. That needs work. The certainty we have of this revelation, the knowledge of God which we have through it, are not scientific, but religious. Our judgment upon these things is not a theoretic one, which can be made good to anybody indifferently. It is what Ritchell calls a worth or fail of value judgment. It has validity only for those who happen to be impressed as we are by the revelation on which it rests, and it must not be carried out in consequences into other spheres than the strictly religious one. If, if he's, I think he's summarizing ritual. We completely disagree there, too. <coughs> Theology should be carried out in medicine. Doesn't mean the medical doctors are going to be talking about God and cancer. We talking about cancer and treating the patient and so forth. But he can. It should be a theologian of some sort who says, "Yeah, this happens somehow under divine providence." We can say more on that, but we don't. No, theology informs every discipline, every fact in the universe. Theology, instead of involving such a general view of the world and life as I have spoken of, instead of standing in direct and vital connection with the whole framework of our knowledge, is shut up in itself. And the doctrine of God, though it be, 
neither affects nor is affected by any independent scientific interpretation of God's world. I think he's dealing with a ritual there. It is easy to see the superficial attractions of this conception. I presume you are as familiar in America as we are in Scotland with the idea that religion and science can never come into conflict because each has a sphere of its own. Let the theologian confine himself to religion, people say, and the scientific man to nature, and they will never meet and therefore never come into co collision. But it's a superficial platitude all the same. Thank you, Dr. Denny. The theologian cannot think of God and leave out of sight the fact that nature with which the scientific man is busy is constituted by God and dependent upon God. In this guy's consistent Calvinist. It's so much different than John Robertson. And one would hope that the scientific man also living not only in nature, but above it, and as its interpreter, would feel the need of defining the relation of nature as a whole to the spiritual power which can be recognized both in it and in himself. A religious man has to live his religious life in nature and to maintain his faith in God living in nature. Now, that's common sense. The scientific man, if he be religious, has precisely the same task, and they are bound by the very nature of intelligence to come to an understanding. They cannot agree to differ. They cannot agree to ignore each other. All that man knows of God and the world must be capable of being constructed into one coherent intellectual whole. All that any one of us knows as a Christian or as a student of science, physical, historical, anthropological, archaeological, archaeological, must be capable of such construction. And our doctrine of God, instead of being defiantly indifferent here, must involve the principles on which this construction shall proceed. We deceive ourselves and try to evade the difficulties of the task which is laid on us when we deny the essential relation which theology must stand to all the contents and problems of our mind and life. The world is all of a piece. Man's mind is all of a piece. And those easy and tempting solutions of our hardest problems, which either arrange the world or the activities of the mind in compartments having no communication with each other, are simply to be rejected. It is quite true that a man may be a very good Christian without being either a physicist or a metaphysician. But the moment one begins to reflect on the contents of his intelligence, he must be able to bring them all, religious, physical or metaphysical, to harmony among themselves. In particular, he must be able to bring everything else into subordination to his idea of God. It must not be a separate thing, but the explanation and interpretation of all his science, physical, historical, and moral. Thank you, Dr. Denny. These generalities, I fear, may not be very impressive, and I will try by one or two examples to show the results to which this separation of the religious and scientific leads, <clears throat> made avowedly by theologians, in the interest of religion, it ends as a rule in leaving religion without its indispensable supports. As a first doctrine, take as a first example, take the fundamental doctrine of the being of God. It is granted, of course, that we owe to Christ our spe specifically Christian thoughts of God. Before the revelation in the Son, we should not have known the Father. We call God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the very soul of our knowledge of him, the most intimate and adequate expression we can give to it. But it is a wise or right thing on the strength of this fact to discredit the arguments by which the human mind has sought to explain 
and vindicate its belief in God on other grounds and to deny them either place or consideration in theology. <clears throat> Granted that we could never attain, simply along the line of these arguments, to the idea of God which is given in the Christian revelation. Does it follow that the Christian idea of God stands in no relation to them, that it does not need their support? I do not believe it, and I am sure the result which excuse me, the result which follows from the contempt with which these philosophical arguments are treated by most of ritual school is not that theology is kept more purely Christian, but that it loses its solidity and objective value. Christian thoughts of God are not wrought into a piece with ins the instinctive movement of intelligence toward its author. For the mind is, as it were, discredited by revelation and divided against itself. This is an intellectual condition which cannot be permanent. Even before Christ came, God did not leave himself without a witness in man. There was that which testified of him, not only in the chosen people of the Old Testament, but in every race and under every sky. There is still a witness, wider than the proclamation of the gospel. And it is surely the business of the theologian not to flout it as superfluous, now that Christ has come, but to understand it, to interpret it, to set it in proper relation to Christ, and in so doing, to reconcile all revelation with that in which the Christian rejoices. For the essential point to notice in all the arguments, as they are called, for the being of God is this. They are not mere fantasies. They are attempts to construe to intelligence the impression which we have received directly or indirectly of something divine in nature or in man or in the relations of nature and man to each other. They are not meant to create, but to interpret impressions. An impression is just as real, if not important, as the impression produced by the revelation of God in Christ. The interpretation may be mistaken or inadequate, but so it may be also where the Christian revelation is concerned. The point is that justice must be done to it in the one case as well as the other, and that the revelation which is consummated in Christ must not be divorced from, but shown in its real connection with those obscure revelations which have been interpreted in the well-known and much criticized arguments of the being of God. Christian theology is not a separate department of intelligence, having no connection with others. Just because it is a doctrine of God, it must have a place and recognition for all those impressions and convictions about God which have exerted their power in man's mind, even apart from the perfect historical revelation. It is not meant at all that no one can be Christian unless he understands the arguments called cosmological, teleological, or ontological. Still less that he is not a Christian unless he understands these names. But this is meant that after all criticism, these arguments do interpret more or less adequately impressions made on the human mind by God and his works. In other words, revelations. And that for that reason, they ought not to be summarily ruled out of court, but treated seriously and shown in their true cr connection with the full Christian truth to poo-poo them because I've never seen that in a theological document. They never made anybody religious is unintelligent. What is really claimed for them is that there is a God in them, especially in their combination, a truth which Christianity presupposes, a truth without which it could not stand. A truth, therefore, which must have an organic place in a true Christian theology. It is not safe to say that in Christ we have everything 
we can know of God or need to know, and that when we say God as Christian people, we mean nothing but the personal character revealed in Christ. The idea of God must be essentially related to all we know. All our knowledge must have something of the revelation in it. It must contribute to our theology. An extreme example of the tendency I've been combating is seen in you, expressed by Herrmann, that's the man who J. Gresham Machen studied under, one of the chief adherents of the ritual, that as far as maintaining the impulse to religious faith is concerned, it does not matter whether our conception of the world is theistic, pantheistic, or materialistic. Its general religious character is unaffected. Ritual himself with the same surrender of science and indeed of reason in theology had even spoken of God, not as the most real of realities, but as the Hulschfortetlung, a help conception for the attainment of the believer's practical ends. God, in other words, is a necessary assumption of the Christian view of man's chief end, but scientifically in its bearing on the interpretation of nature and history, for example, it may be left an open question whether there is a God or not. In principle, this attempt to distinguish between the religious and the theoretic, to assign separate spheres to reason and faith, for that when it comes to amounts to the betrayal of truth. It is really an attempt to build a religious certainty on indifference to reason or the skepticism of it. And reason always avenges itself by keeping in its own power something which is essential to faith. Another example, which seems at first to be on a smaller scale, yet in its consequences reaches very far, may be found in the treatment by the same school, the Richlands, Herman, and that whole crowd, may be found of the idea of the supernatural. Here also the avowed intention to exclude the metaphysical and to do justice to the religious. It is carefully pointed out, for instance, that the Bible never defines miracle as the apologists or dogmatists of a scholastic theology try to define it. Dr. Denny is telling us about the rolling, rising tide. Verse 2 of him 251. Another year its course has run. Thy loving care renew. Forgive the ill that we have done. The good we failed to do. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Godspeed.